My name is Maxim Marlinspike. I am a fellow at the Institute for Disruptive Studies, and I want to talk a little bit about privacy today. Um, thanks for coming and sticking around. I know it's the last talk of the end of two long days, so I'll try not to wax too much. Um, but I want to talk sort of generally about privacy and uh, those trends, as well as um, maybe talk a little bit more specifically about a few projects that I'm working on and that I've seen other people working on as well. Uh, so I guess what I'd like to do is start by looking into the past, talking about the threats that we saw previously, the projects that we thought were important, uh, the ways that we wanted to mitigate those threats. And then I want to talk a little bit about how I see those threats changing and some speculation into the future of what I think is going to be important moving forward and things that I'm interested in working on to address those situations. So looking into the past, uh, a lot of the sort of technology narrative in the 1990s was dominated by this thing, the web browser. When Netscape first introduced Netscape Navigator, it was almost revolutionary. And immediately, uh, many people moved to capitalize on that knowledge. Uh, one of the major players that quickly moved uh, was Microsoft, uh, and they wanted to protect their interests by introducing Internet Explorer. And so when they did this, the technology narrative of sort of the late 90s was transformed from not just the web browser, but more this war between web browsers, the browser wars. And we all know how that went. Uh, but at the same time, there was another war that was happening. And it was somewhat more subtle, but perhaps even more important. And it was a war over this thing, the little lock icon in your web browser, and more importantly, the ideas behind it. On one side of this war were the psychopaths. These are people who wanted to see this information spread wildly. They wanted to uh, disseminate this information in the software as effectively as they could. And on the other side of the war were the eavesdroppers. Uh, these were people who wanted to prevent the spread of this information. Uh, they wanted to uh, limit the use of crypto cryptography and put it in as few hands as possible. And so the lines were drawn. And on one side of this war, the psychopunk side, you had people like Matt Blaze, Philip Zimmerman, Ian Goldberg, David Shaw, Timothy May, the heroes of my teenage years. And the eavesdroppers thought that these people were dangerous. In fact, their ideas scared the fuck out of them. <laughs> they were talking about the move from a world where the eavesdroppers had ultimate control and access to all communication and information to a world where they would have no control and no access to any communication or information. In fact, they thought this was so dangerous that they classified these ideas as weapons. That, at least in the United States, if you wrote a little bit of crypto code and uh, sent it to your friend in Canada, that was tantamount to uh, shipping Stinger missiles. And uh, you could be tried and prosecuted as such. At the same time, the government realized that uh, these ideas were perhaps potentially interesting to some people and that they would want them. And so they realized that they had to come up with their own solution. And for them, that was a key escrow, which was best embodied by the Clipper chip. And the idea was that this is a totally opaque chip uh, that no one knows the, the internals, of, no one knows about the details of the internals, and that the government would embed this into every piece of consumer communications equipment, every telephone, every fax machine, every personal computer. And then you could use this inside all of these devices to establish secure communications channels with other people. Um, it was essentially like a little crypto processor. Uh, the only trick is that, of course, uh, the government would have sort of like a master key, which they could then use to decrypt whatever communication they were interested in. Um, so the main problem for the eavesdroppers during this time is that cryptography is not a banana. That is to say that information is not an object. And if you have a banana and you share it with a friend, uh, there is still only one person in the world with a banana. If that friend then gives the banana to someone else, there is still only one person in the world with a banana. With information, every time you share it, uh, you make a copy, and so you increase the chance for an exponential explosion of that information. This situation was made worse by one of the main cypherpunk mantras, cypherpunks write code. A lot of 
great work had been done in academia of developing cryptography outside of uh, government control, um, but it was mostly theoretical. It was mostly in uh, white papers and uh, you know talked about in conferences. There's very little actual software. And what cypherpunks wanted was software that people could use. They wanted to write software, distribute it widely, so that anyone who wanted to use cryptography could use it. And so they kind of went nuts. Um, some people moved to Anguilla, which is a uh, Caribbean island that has very favorable laws in terms of uh, cryptography and export restriction. And uh, they moved there and rapidly started writing crypto code and exporting it all around the world. Um, people tried all kinds of other interesting strategies. Uh, in 1995, uh, Philip Zimmerman published a book called uh, PGP Source Code and Eternals. He published this with MIT Press. The book was nothing but the PGP source code printed in a machine-readable font. Uh, it was a very small print run, and the idea is that if you have a digital representation of cryptography and you uh, send it to your friend in Canada, that's exporting munitions. Uh, if you have a book and you send it to your friend in Canada, that is protected as speech. And so what they did was print the source code to PGP in this book with machine-readable font, uh, small print run, mailed it to every place in the world that they would like to see cryptography, and then the people there simply scanned it back in, and now they had a copy of PGP that had been uh, distributed totally legally. So uh, strategies like this continued, and uh, people were very rapidly pursuing the uh, dissemination of cryptography, and uh, they were more and more effective until in 2000, the Clinton administration suddenly changed their tune and they repealed all of the significant laws uh, restricting the use and export of cryptography. And it sort of seemed like the world was won. Uh, no. That um, the cypherpunks had done it and gotten cryptography um, all around the world. And if you go back and you look at the cypherpunk predictions, uh, their most prescient prediction was that the spread of information would become inevitable. The premise of their entire existence was that cryptography will become ubiquitous. And that was the thing that they were most right about. Uh, this was sort of one of the first times that we saw how information really does want to be free. However, their other predictions about what would happen once cryptography was everywhere were somewhat less prescient. Um, these were things like uh, anonymous digital cash will flourish intellectual property will disappear, surveillance will become impossible, uh, governments will be unable to continue collecting taxes, and eventually governments will fall. These are predictions that they made on things like the uh, cypherpunks mailing list, and uh, in the crypto, -anarcho crypto anarchist manifesto, and the cypherpunks FAQ. But if you flash forward 10 years after this sort of victory of the spread of cryptography, Cryptography is the thing that allows you to securely transmit your credit card number to Amazon.com so that you can buy a copy of Sarah Palin's book, On Going Rogue. Sure, uh, everyone's mother has an illegal copy of an MP3 somewhere. Cryptography is somewhat ubiquitous. And there are actual dark nets that have been developed which uh, should make the eradication of information impossible. But surveillance is at an all-time high, and privacy is probably at an all-time low. So what happened? We had this sort of dramatic war. It seemed like we were victorious. And now we're in this unfortunate situation. Well, I guess my major thesis is that um, the cypherpunks were, in a way, preparing for a future. And the future that they thought they were going to get was fascism. But what we got was social democracy. And that's not really better. It's just different. Um, let me give you an example of what I mean. How many people here would be excited about a law that required everyone to carry a government-mandated tracking device with them at all times? <laughs> Probably very few people, right? No one's really excited about that. OK, so let me ask a different question. There's one. All right, get out. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Well, my second question was, um, how many people here have a cell phone? Right. Probably everybody in this room has a mobile phone. 
And so what is, what is the difference, really? A mobile phone is a tracking device that reports its position over an insecure protocol.